welcome back to Words of Wisdom for Shalom World TV. Uh, once again, my name is Ryan Beaupre, and today we're at the Way of Holiness Retreat Center in Hinton, Alberta, Canada. It's an absolutely stunning day here in God's gorgeous Rocky Mountains. So far in this series, we've been talking about God. God under various aspects. The One God, the Triune God, that God loves you and that you love God. Today, we're going to talk about how God is truth. God is truth. Friends, God knows you. God knows you. This is a theme throughout the scriptures, that there is nothing that occurs that God does not know. God knows the hairs on your head. God knows you before you were formed in your mother's womb, as he says to the prophet Jeremiah. And a theme throughout the scriptures is that when God knows you, and he does, that purifies your heart, that transforms you, that wipes away your impurities. I want to share with you a story from the first uh, chapter of the Gospel of John, where Jesus meets some of his first apostles. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and he said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answers, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. Jesus said to Philip, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That's an interesting story. It doesn't seem very dramatic. It's just Jesus talking to some of his apostles. But there's an apostle who doubts. And then when Jesus reveals to him, I saw you before I met you. I saw you reclining under the fig tree. Nathanael's heart is pierced. And he thinks, who is this man who knows me so deeply, knows me so intimately, that it leads him to say, you are the son of God. My gosh, what a leap. And from this knowledge of Christ, and from being known by Christ, Nathaniel is going to see wonders, going to see great things. What does it mean to say God knows you? How does God know you? What does that mean? Does God have a telescope? I mean, he's watching you all the time. He's a bit like Santa Claus. He knows when you're naughty or nice. Of course not. Uh, this is not what we're talking about when we say God knows you. Instead, what's going on here is that God, once again, is not a thing among things He's not a being among beings. It's not that there's a dog and then a tree and then the planet Jupiter and then, oh, there's God. No, 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 no. God is the source and the cause of everything else. He brings it into being, upholds it in being. And it's precisely because God creates all that is that God knows all that is. A really, really loose analogy is something like this. A musician, say someone's playing the violin or the piano, they've got a feeling for their instrument in the way that I look on and I'm like, how's that happening? I don't understand. But they know their instrument through and through. It's almost an extension of them. Or if you're playing golf, you swing your golf club. You're not your golf club, but it feels like a part of you. You know everything about it. You know its position, you know its weight, you know how it's going to affect the things around it. 
It's not that God is the same thing as his creation. That's pantheism. That's not what Christians believe. Um, it's also not true. But rather, uh, it's that God is causing everything at every moment. And because of that, he knows it through and through. He knows it intimately. He knows how it affects the things around it. Why does Jupiter exist? Because God is causing it to exist. And because he's causing it to exist, he knows it almost as an extension of himself. Take a moment to think about the extent of God's knowledge. He knows the hairs on your head. Wonderful. A sparrow doesn't fall to the ground without the father knowing. But consider the vastness of creation. Consider the two trillion galaxies in the visible universe. In each of those galaxies is supposed to be a hundred billion planets. I have no idea how they calculate these things, but my gosh, that's a lot. Those planets are massive. How many, how many rocks, how many atoms are in these planets? And God causes all of it to be. In an instant is sort of playing with words because God's not in time. But God causes all of creation to be at every single moment, knowing every atom, knowing every tree, knowing every doggo, knowing every aspect of your heart through and through. God knows you. Where do we go from there if we accept this, that God knows you because he creates you? An important thing is that you can't hide. You can't hide from God. Maybe you're in your business practice and you're doing something pretty shady. And you know that is pretty shady, but your thought is, hey, no one's going to find out. Friend, God knows everything more than you do. He knows what's in your heart. He knows what's in the heart of your customers. He knows exactly what's on your checkbook. He's causing it to be. You can't run away from him. Perhaps there's someone in your life, a relationship, where you just can't stand this person and you don't want to love them and you don't want to forgive them. You want to hold on to your anger and your frustration and indeed your hatred for this person. There's no hiding that. God knows your heart. In a way, that's kind of terrifying, isn't it? That there's no hiding from God. Reflecting on this, I think a really, really useful image is that as you get closer to God, things become more apparent. You start to see the world the way that God sees the world. If you are driving a car, here in Canada, we've got an issue uh, called winter. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. It's not fun. It gets very, very cold. Uh, it hits minus 40 Celsius regularly here. My goodness. One thing we do to get rid of the ice is we use a ton of uh, salt on our roads. And that salt can spray up onto our windshields. Normally, this isn't a problem. If it's dark outside, you can see just fine. But then, as you turn towards the sun, your windshield is almost impossible to see through because all the salt and all the bugs and all the buildup on the wind windshield becomes incredibly clear. So normally, you're fine, but as you start driving towards the sun, you see all of these blocks, all of this gross stuff that's keeping you from driving well. In the same way, it's the, our, with our relationship with God and the fact that he knows your heart, the concern is less, does God know it? And the concern is, do you know it the way God knows it? Let's pray throughout our day to see our hearts, to see our lives, to see the world the way God sees and knows it. Let's pray that we see all the bugs and ice and salt on our windshields. Let's pray that we can see our, our grudges and our lusts and our greeds and our gluttony in our hearts. Let's pray that the light of Christ cleanses and purifies our hearts. Let's take one more example from the Gospels, hey? You might remember on Holy Thursday and Good Friday, at the Holy Thursday Supper, St. Peter, the first Pope, 
says to Jesus with this incredible exuberance, Lord, wherever you go, I'll die for you. And Jesus says, well, actually, Peter, before the cock, cock crows tomorrow morning, you'll deny me three times, right? Christ knows Peter's heart. He knows how weak he is and he loves him anyway, but he knows how weak he is. Jesus is arrested. The next morning, Peter is following behind at a distance, but he's terrified, he has confused, he has no idea what he's doing. And he's sitting outside uh, the place where Jesus is being kept, warming himself by a fire. People start questioning him. Aren't you, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? Don't you know this man who was just thrown into prison? And Peter says, no, I have no idea who this man is. And he denies Christ. Just a few hours ago, he said he would die for Christ. And this repeats, and Peter denies Christ three times. And then the cock crows. And what catches me in this story is not so much the denials, not so much the knowledge of Christ, but that once that cock crows, Peter breaks down and he starts crying. And he thinks, what have I done? What have I done? Christ predicted this, Christ knew his heart. And so in that moment, once the cock crows, Peter knows his heart the way God knows his heart, just for a moment. And it's that knowing your heart the way Christ knows your heart that brings Peter back. So, what do we get out of this? What do we learn? Stop trying to hide your sins from yourself. Stop trying to lie to yourself and the people around you about your weaknesses. You are weak. And God loves you anyway, eh? He knows that. He sees your weaknesses more than you do and he loves you anyway. The light of Christ purifies our hearts. So God is truth, God knows you. That's wonderful. But let's switch gears and talk about whether we know God. There is this idea in the air, at least here in Canada. I don't know if it's in the whole world, but that Christianity is something silly, that faith is something a bit dumb and kind of for dumb people. When I was a young kid, when I was a teenager, I think I thought this uh, and I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in the faith at all because I thought it was silly and for silly people. And that to be a Christian, you had to take your intellect and kind of step on it a little bit. And you had to ignore reasons and you had to just believe, just believe. We tell this to children sometimes. Stop asking questions, just believe. Friends, I want you to know that this is wrong. <laughs> this is wrong. Ask questions about the faith. Try to wrestle with the faith. Try to understand who God is. Ask a million questions. Part of being a Christian is trying to figure this thing out. God gave us brains, He gave us minds, intellects, and He wants us to use them. So we can look at the history of philosophy and theology, we can look at the history of the natural sciences, and we'll see that Christianity has always been at the fore of these things. Just very briefly, to talk about the natural sciences, physics and chemistry and whatnot. Um, we have the great Gregor Mendel, the founder of genetics, who was an Augustinian canon. We have Saint Albert the Great in the 1100s, who was a chemist who discovered sulfuric acid, and maybe built the first robot, an automaton with a bunch of gears and such. Who knew? Um, or my personal favorite is Father Georges Lemaitre in the early 20th century in KU Leuven in Belgium. Father Georges Lemaitre was a physicist and a priest, obviously, and he first proposed the Big Bang Theory. So our contemporary cosmology, right, that everything in the universe came from a single incredibly dense, incredibly hot point roughly 13.77 billion years ago, give or take 40 million years. This theory, this rapid expansion of the universe, was proposed by a Catholic priest in studying the cosmic microwave background radiation. I think it's marvelous. I think it's marvelous that, that the faith likes to know things about God's creation. I want to give another example. My hero, Saint Thomas Aquinas, lived in the 1200s. And he was one of the greatest minds in the history of the church. They say that he could dictate five separate books to five separate scribes at once. He certainly had all of scripture memorized. 
by all means, a brilliant, brilliant man. However, uh, there's a story that's always caught me. When he was a kid, he was in a classroom in a Benedictine monastery in Monte Cassino, and they say the teacher was going on and on and on about things that God had done in scripture. God, uh, God has done this and God has done that. And St. Thomas Aquinas, then a kid, just raises his hand and says, but teacher, what is God? And he cuts right to the heart of the matter and wants to understand who is this God? What is this God? Again, uh, St. Thomas grew up and he became a Dominican friar in the order of preachers. One time in him, him and a number of his brothers, his friars, were traveling and they reached the city of Paris. And they come to the crest of a hill and they can see the whole city laid out beneath them. One of the friars is marveling at all of this. Oh my gosh, there's all these towers, all these churches. And he says to St. Thomas, what would you do to be king of all of this, to have all of the city of Paris? And St. Thomas, who by all accounts daydreamed constantly, woke up out of his daydream and said, I would actually rather have Chrysostom's homilies on the Gospel of Matthew, this lost text. What did St. Thomas want? Not power, not money, not prestige, not honor, but to understand the scriptures, to understand the things of God, and to use his mind, to use his intellect, to be a more and more fulfilled image of God, who is a mind, who is an intellect, who knows things. In striving to be good Christians, in striving to become more and more perfect images of God, we have to use our minds and ask questions. This is part of the game. So, if you have a child who asks a million questions about the Bible, encourage that child. Never say stop. Never tell them to shut up. Never say to just believe. Because we think about things, and the more we think about things, the more we bring forward our reasons, then the more we believe. This is the faith. One last thought for you today, folks, about coming to know God and the things of God. When we're trying to understand something, usually what that means is we're trying to understand the cause of the thing. So what's around me? You take one of these trees, for example, and you're like, I want to understand that tree. Why is that tree there? The story is going to involve causes. It's going to involve the seeds that created this tree, the evolution of the tree back for millions of years. We're going to talk about the wind that brought the seed to that exact spot. We're going to talk about the, the rain and the sun that helped this tree grow. We're trying to understand all the causes which brought about this tree in such and such a way. To know things is to understand their causes. What that means is this. At the end of the day, to know anything, you'll need to know God who is the source and the cause of all that is. I can talk about trees and I can talk about rocks all day long, but the only way I'll truly understand them, their purpose, is if I understand the God who made them. To understand things, you need to understand their causes. If I want to understand the universe, if I dive into cosmology and into astrophysics, which is an excellent thing to do, I encourage you to do so, at the end of the day, you have to understand the God who caused the universe and the God whom the universe images. And that God is infinite truth. You'll never exhaust reflecting on him and what he's done on his, in history. I think you could probably exhaust the knowledge about, say, this rock or that plant. You could learn a lot about it. You could eventually understand all the molecular structure there, but that won't be the case for God because he is infinite. He is the only thing that can satisfy our infinite desire for knowledge. Maybe you're a researcher in the universities. You feel like you get to a certain point that you just want more and more and more and you want to understand things and you feel you're never going to exhaust the mysteries of the universe and that's, you're confused. You think, I want something that will satisfy my intellect, where I feel I know a thing and can dive deeper into it and marvel in this. 
What you desire is to know God. St. Thomas Aquinas says the essence of heaven is precisely that, that we'll know God, that we'll see him as he is, and in so doing, we'll delight in him and love him with everything we've got. All right, folks, where are we at? God knows you. God knows you inside and out because he causes you, like a musician knows their instrument. So, God knows your weaknesses. Don't be afraid of them. Don't lie to yourself about them. Let the light of Christ purify your heart. In our own search for God, never, ever, ever denigrate your mind, your intellect. Ask questions, read good books, read the scriptures, find intelligent people to learn from. Encourage that questioning behavior in your children because faith builds upon reason. And at the end of the day, all of this will lead us with grace to heaven where we will gaze upon infinite truth, who is God, for all eternity. Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World.